in a sobering analysis of the recent Iranian strike on Israel's Nevatim Air Base, former U.S. Marine Corps intelligence officer Scott Ritter sheds light on the strategic implications of the attack, which saw at least seven hypersonic missiles raining down on the strategically significant military installation. Ritter, renowned for his expertise in military intelligence and strategic affairs, delves into the intricacies of Iran's precision strike, which targeted the base housing Israel's prized F-35 fighters. Drawing on his extensive experience in analyzing military tactics and capabilities, Ritter emphasizes the significance of Iran's successful deployment of hypersonic missiles, a technological leap that caught Israel's defenses off guard. The absence of intercepted Iranian missiles, as noted by Ritter, underscores a critical vulnerability in Israel's air defense systems, exposing a gap that adversaries could exploit in future conflicts. With Nevatim compromised and the F-35 fleet potentially at risk, Ritter stresses the urgent need for Israel to reassess its diplomatic posture and invest in countering emerging threats through peace and not wars. Ritter's analysis serves as a wake-up call for Israeli policymakers and military planners, urging them to confront the reality of evolving security challenges in the region. As tensions simmer in the aftermath of the strike, Ritter warns of the broader implications for regional stability, emphasizing the need for proactive measures to prevent further escalation. As Israel grapples with the fallout from the attack, Ritter's insights offer valuable perspective on the evolving dynamics of Middle Eastern security and the imperative for strategic foresight in safeguarding national interests. With Iran demonstrating its military capabilities on Israel's doorstep, Ritter's analysis underscores the pressing need for concerted efforts to address defense gaps and bolster deterrence in an increasingly uncertain geopolitical landscape. Let's be clear. What Iran just did is reestablish deterrence. You see, Israel believed that it could launch a strike against Iran and suffer no consequence. That is no longer the case. Right now, Iranian mil or Israeli military officials are looking at the damage done to their bases, and they understand the following, that Iran deliberately chose not to inflict uh, extremely lethal action against Israel, that Iran struck buildings designed to send a signal to Israel, and indeed to the United States, that it could do what it did in Nevatim, at Ramona, anywhere in Israel, anywhere in the Middle East. And there was nothing the United, United States <clears throat> or Israel could do in response. This is deterrence. This means that in the future, if either Israel or the United States uh, plan on carrying out an action against Iran, they have to weigh in the consequences of their actions, knowing that Iran has the capacity to reach out and touch any place, any spot, any target in the region, in Israel, we're out of Israel, and there's nothing anybody could do to stop that. This is why President Joe Biden has been on the phone with Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, telling him, do not retaliate. The United States will not be a partner in any offensive action against Iran. Not because the United States is friendly to Iran, but the United States understands the consequences that will accrue should such an attack take place. You see, the United States has been deterred against further action against Iran. Now the question is, what will Israel do? Israel has been trying to lead the United States into a larger conflict with Iran for some time now. Indeed, some people have speculated that the Israeli attack against the Iranian consulate in Damascus was designed for just that purpose, to start a spiral of escalation that would ultimately lead to the United States being drawn into a larger conflict uh, between Israel and Iran. But the Iranians were very clever in designing their response, just like they did when they retaliated against the United States for the assassination of Qasem Soleimani back in 2020. At that time, Iran launched over a dozen missiles against the Al-Assad Air Base in Iraq. Those missiles struck the air base with extreme precision, but Iran had given the United States advance notice that that base was going to be struck. 
the United States was able to put its people into bunkers, and Iran ended up destroying empty buildings. But it demonstrated to the United States that it had the capacity to strike any American base in the region with extreme precision and kill as many Americans as they wanted, if they wanted to do that. And America was deterred against future action of that sort. Will Israel be deterred? Again, the Israelis are waking up today, looking at the damage done, understanding that there isn't a place in Israel today that's safe from Iranian ballistic missile attack. That means that Israel understands that any escalation could mean the destruction of Israel. Israel probably isn't going to launch a response against Iran. Israel has been deterred from launching that response by the Iranian actions. And in this case, we could say that Operation True Promise was an extraordinarily successful operation, not only for Iran, but indeed for the world, because Iranian deterrence now is a reality that can hold Israel and the United States in check. Every impartial observer affirms that Israel initiated the strike against Iran. Had restraint been exercised, the world wouldn't be teetering on the brink as it is now. Israel sought to test Iran's resolve and deterrence, only to realize that strategic patience and diplomacy should prevail over aggression. Despite unprecedented support from the United States, Jordan, France, and the United Kingdom, the Islamic Republic has proven its deterrence capability by striking Israel. This move has reshaped its position on the deterrence scale. What's needed now is for Israel to temper its rhetoric and pursue peace through diplomacy and restraint. Scott Ritter's insights are invaluable in this context. This is a war Israel is never going to win because it's predicated upon the military destruction of Hamas and the political destruction of Hamas. Hamas today continues to resist. Israel hasn't destroyed it. We can't put a, a percentage on the uh, on what level of destruction Hamas has suffered. Uh, a couple about a month ago, the United States said they believed that 35 percent of Hamas's military capacity was destroyed. Uh, in reporting to uh, Nasrallah, uh, the Al Qasim Brigade said 10 percent of their capacity had been destroyed. What's the truth? Somewhere in between that. Um, more? I don't know. But they haven't been destroyed. Six months in, Hamas is still resisting. Israel has succeeded in depopulating certain parts of um, of Gaza. But then what, what happened? They had the troops there, and Hamas kept popping out of holes, killing them. It was a death by a thousand cuts. You can't, what are you going to bomb? There's nothing left to bomb. They bombed all the civilians. They bombed everything. They've committed their cultural and, and ethnic genocide by moving 1.6 million people into the Rafah area. But Hamas is still everywhere killing the Israelis. Meanwhile, Israel went off and committed its you know, crime against uh, the Iranians, blowing up the consulate in, in, uh, in Damascus. The Iranians now are saying they will retaliate. Now, here's the problem. If Iran retaliates um, and strikes Israel, Israel says they're going to strike Iran. When that happens, all bets are off. Hezbollah goes to war against Israel. It's all over. Big, big war that Israel can't win. Israel has stress test itself. The reason why I say Israel can't win is because Israel has prepared for this. They actually did two consecutive major exercises. Last year's, I think, was called Chariots of Fire, um, where they stress tested their system, meaning they're fighting everybody at the same time. But you see, the remember we were talking about Christopher Cavoli and imagining war? The war that the Israelis imagined was a full-scale war with Hezbollah on the Lebanese border, a war where Syria made an effort at the Golan Heights, and a war where Iran um, intervened to help that. But when it came to Hamas and the West Bank, they expected there would be sort of a new intifada in the West Bank, but that could be suppressed with a handful of troops acting very violently to keep it down. Gaza... They just said, you know, Hamas may come out and blow up a couple things, but it's, fire some rockets, but guys will be under control. So very little military force needed to keep the Palestinians under control. All military force focused on Hezbollah, Syria, Iran, and they still lost. I just want to let everybody know that the Israelis in the end lost. They don't have the ability to win that war. So now Israel's getting ready to have that war. 
but 60% of their military was tied down in Gaza. So the calculations that they made that said we won't need military power in Gaza were wrong. All the military power they needed up here, even though they lost, was now down here. So what did Israel do? They pulled the troops out of Gaza. They took these maneuver brigades up and parked them near the Lebanese border where they're resting, they're refitting, they're repairing, uh, and they're in readiness in case there is this war, which they'll lose because they can't win it. But if those troops were in Gaza, tied down fighting an enemy that they can't defeat, they would just lose the war against Hezbollah even quicker. So if they know that Iran might retaliate, they know that it might lead to an escalation that requires Israel to fight a major conflict with Hezbollah, but they didn't have sufficient forces for that. So they had to pull these units out and move them up there. Now, if the situation uh, happens where there isn't a, a major war that Iran retaliates, but Israel says, okay, we accept this retaliation. Maybe we only hit a place here and they keep it you know, escalation under control. You don't get a major war that doesn't erupt a you know, major conflict with Hezbollah. Then these units can be brought back and used against Rafah if necessary. Um, so that's what's going on. Um, you know, but the, 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 the fact is we see the coalition falling apart because let me, let me, let me put it this way in the history of U S Israeli relations, especially the modern history, the since, since camp David, no American president has been elected on a platform that opposes Israel and no Israeli prime minister has stayed in power on a platform that opposes the United States. We have a situation here where Joe Biden has made it clear because Joe Biden is worried about his election. If Israel goes into Rafah, that's it. Joe Biden will never win the election. It'll be all over. Biden knows this. So now he is saying, in order for me to even be viable in November, I have to oppose Israel. It's unprecedented. Oppose. And this means that there will be consequences for Israeli action. Benjamin Netanyahu is sitting there saying, I, I got to stay in power. The moment I stop being in power, um, I, I, I leave. They're going to arrest me and charge me with corruption and put me in jail. And then they're going to do a trial and put me on trial for what happened on October 7th. And the whole world may come after me. My only way of being viable is to remain as prime minister. But in order to remain prime minister, I have to keep this ruling coalition together of right wing fanatics, including the guy you just mentioned whose name I would butcher if I tried to say Bing Gavir, I think you said Bing Gavir. Yeah, I'm not very good with names, so you got to forgive me. Uh, there's a great meme. I uh, I don't know. I spent a long time uh, mispronouncing uh, Bob Al-Mandeb and uh, fumbled it. And somebody, a very clever person, did a great meme that mocked me for it, and I appreciated it. But I, I'm linguistically challenged at times. So, um, But anyways, the, 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 this, this coalition's an unsustainable coalition. So, you know, Netanyahu is in a damned if you do, damned if you don't position right now. Um, if he goes against Rafah, he's going to lose American help, and that's going to destroy him because the Israelis will sweep him out of power. The moment the United States cuts off military aid to Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu will be thrown out of power by Israelis who know they can't survive without American aid. So he's playing a game where he's, he's just trying to play each other off. But the moment he kowtows to American pressure, the coalition will collapse and he'll be swept from power. So what sustains him? A larger war with Iran and Hezbollah. That allows him to avoid the Rafah issue and it compels America to continue to provide weaponry. This is a very dangerous situation that we're in because we've allowed one man, Benjamin Netanyahu, to put his personal survivability politically and to be honest physically because if he goes to jail he's going to die in jail uh, he's not a man in good health and he's going to sacrifice everything including israel for this i wish the israelis would wake up and understand what this man is doing to them i hope america is waking up and coming to that sense i think the world is starting to come to that sense the most evil man in the world today is named benjamin netanyahu He's the greatest threat to international peace and security that has ever existed in modern times because he is, again, I just want to reemphasize to people, a conflict between Israel and Iran isn't just a conflict between Israel and Iran. It becomes a regional conflict that will bring in an energy capacity, uh, energy security capa you know, uh, capacity and um, overall economic thing. 
the Iranians will shut down the Strait of Hormuz, which means none of you are getting oil. The Bab al Mandeb will also be shut down. None of you are going to get any container ships. If you attack Iran's oil infrastructure, Iran will destroy all oil infrastructure. So nobody's going to get oil. Um, and now we're all sitting here in America, you know, thinking life's great, you know, $3.46 a gallon. It's a little high, but, you know, we can do it. We've adjusted to that. But what happens when it becomes $12 a gallon because the price of oil has gone crazy? What happens when there's no diesel? And all those trucks that drive the food around America go, well, we can't drive anymore. We don't have any diesel. And if they can't drive the food, that means going to, you know, uh, Hannaford or Price Chopper or Safeway uh, to go to grocery shopping, you're going to go in, the shelves are going to be empty because there ain't going to be nothing there. Go to Walmart. There's always something at Walmart. No, there won't be anything at Walmart because the trucks ain't arriving. And suddenly your life sucks. Suddenly you're hungry. You don't have the, the things that make life livable. Um, your salary isn't going to go up. It's going to be all blown on this. You're going to see people unable to pay their mortgages, a collapse in the housing industry. I mean, we're talking the end of the economic world as we know it. So for all those idiots out there that are cheering this on, all you pro-Israeli people, it's time for Israel to take out Iran. Shut up. And for all you people out there who are anti-Israel, it's time for the Iranians to pound Israel. Shut up. You're messing with my life. You're messing with the life of my family, my friends, my community. The world does not need a war between Israel and Iran. It's the worst thing that could possibly happen at this point in time. So quit cheering for it and quit supporting Benjamin Netanyahu. That man's holding the whole world hostage for his little personal, yeah, he's 76 years old. He's in bad health. He's going to die soon anyways. Get him the hell out of office. Give him a pardon. Give him a damn pardon. Just say, Benjamin, your pardon. Go die. But get the hell out of here so we don't die. When they attack the... Iranian consulate in Syria, right after that, they said that Iran would attack Israel in 24 hours. Who said that? <laughs> the Western media. You know what the month of Ramadan is? Yeah. So in the month of Ramadan, you think Iran's going to go to war against Israel? Or would they wait until um, Eid Fitr? That's today, right? It's the end of Ramadan. <gasps> I'll tell you what. Now we can probably talk about Iran striking Israel within 24 to 48 hours because they no longer have the burden of Ramadan on their shoulders. But anybody who's sitting there talking about an immediate re Iranian retaliation for that, they don't understand the Islamic Pub Republic of Iran. They don't understand the Muslim world. It's going to be you know, very difficult for the Muslim world to rally around uh, Iran in this struggle during Ramadan. The day after Ramadan, not so difficult anymore. So I, 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 I think that the Western media just shows its ignorance and its bias and its proclivity for fear mongering when they put out nonsense like that. But we know how much Nadneo is in love with bringing the United States into the conflict. Is there any chance out there for the Nadneo administration to bring in the United States into the conflict in the no, Middle East? No, never has been. It's a false premise on the part of Iran goes back to obama you know where they were taught there in the the reason why obama went and did the jcpoa the, the iran nuclear deal is that he had gotten boxed into a rhetorical corner you know we you know because he bought into the israeli rhetoric no one one spinning centrifuge is a problem it's a nuclear program if iran doesn't give up its nuclear program we we'll have no choice but to you know get rid of it ourselves and iran went we're not getting rid of it and the Israelis are like, see, it's a bad threat. It's a bad threat. You guys got to be ready. Don't worry, Israel. We're with you. Iran, you need to give up. We're not giving it up. The next thing you know, Obama's sitting there going, damn, we only have one option now. And that's to do what the Israelis want us to do is attack Iran. But we can't do that. So they did the deal. They did the deal that they a year prior to that nobody was talking about. Nobody thought it could happen. They did the deal. Why? We're not going to go to war against Iran for Israel. That just is never going to happen. Never going to happen. I'll say it one more time just to make the emphasis. The United States of America will never go to war against Iran on behalf of Israel. We're not going to let the Israelis have that kind of control over not only our future, but the world's future. I just explained to you the consequences of regional conflict. We're not going to commit suicide, economic suicide on behalf of Israel. 
especially by starting a war that can be avoided. So Netanyahu and the entire Israeli military leadership, they know they can't go to war against Iran unless the United States is part of it. Now, watch what happens. They're going to initiate something, and we're going to stand by as Iran pounds the living stuff out of, uh, I've watched my language there, the living hell out of uh, Israel. We're not going to do a damn thing about it because this is Israel's problem. This is Israel's fault. There doesn't need to be a conflict. Iran didn't start this. Israel did. And we will never go to war against Iran on behalf of Israel because the consequences of that conflict are too, are too big. And we will advise everybody to stay the hell out of this fight. We'll advise the Saudis to stay out. Everybody will stay out of this fight. And Israel will pay the price. And it's high time that Israel learned the hard lesson that they, they're just a tiny little insignificant country in the Middle East with a, a history tied to a Bible that's deeply flawed. I mean, we only have to start talking about, you know, the, the, the lineage of Moses and how um, Israeli scholars through the years manufactured it to explain the, 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 the transition from the Levites to something, the high priest. And the, it's just made up crap. Most of it. Um, I'm not trying to be anti-religion, but even the religious people say, yeah, this, this stuff's just made up. Somebody just made this stuff up. Um, and a lot of Israel's claim to the Holy Land is based upon manufactured biblical reality. We're going to let those people destroy all of our lives? Not on your life. Not on your life. It isn't going to happen. Well, remember, the only reason why Erdogan's doing this now is he just had a, um, they, they had local elections where the, um, where his ruling party uh, for the first time since he they came in power in 2001 didn't get the majority of the uh, popular vote. I think the CHP got 36%, AKP got 35% of the vote. But they also, one of the reasons uh, that they, they did poorly is that, you know, to win the presidential and, um, and parliamentarian elections, the, AP, the AKP created uh, a coalition of uh, parties so that, uh, you know, they didn't have to meet the, uh, I forget what the 7% vote threshold or something like that to qualify to be a member of parliament. So they, these guys got seats in the parliament because of that. But some of these guys backed away from the AKP and uh, friends, there's an extreme Islamist party that, uh, that broke away. And that cost the AKP uh, some, some provinces, some governorships, some may mayoral stuff. Um, and the other thing too, is that the just the overall state of the economy and resentment against uh, Aragon for Israeli policy just caused a lot of, you know, AKP supporters to stay home. Um, the, 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 the vote, the turnout was, was low compared to normal uh, turnout. Um, and so Erdogan's looking at that and saying, okay, the way I need to salvage this situation is to win back those voters who I lost because of my policies on it. So he's putting this stuff in, but a lot of the products you're talking about are refined products. But has he shut down the pipeline out of Azerbaijan? That's the key question. Does Azeri oil still flow to a Turkish port and get put on a ship and shipped to Israel, who then can refine these products on their own? Um, and until he does that, this is, it's, it's, not, it's not a game changer. Um, he has to shut down Azeri oil to Israel. Um, now, and maybe the public will put pressure on them to do that. But where's the equivalent election in Saudi Arabia? Oh, they don't have it. So how can the people put pressure on the Saudi Arabian government? I mean, because now it's, it's different because there is no democratic outlet for frustration. There would be, you know, violence in the streets. Um, you know, are we there yet? Not yet. Uh, where's the pressure in Jordan? Are they going to throw the, the Hashemite king out in Jordan like the Iraqis did in Iraq in the, in, you know, in the 1940s? Um, not yet. Egypt, where's, where's, where's the public you know, uprising against Egypt throwing Sisi out on the street? Not yet. So I, I, I think that we're a long way away from the Arab street having meaningful impact on uh, their governments so that these kind of, um, of, uh, embargoes because here's the thing it, it, i think it will happen eventually um i think israel's finished as a nation state i think that they have created uh, the conditions for their own demise uh, 
you know, in order to survive, Israel needed to have this India Middle East economic corridor connectivity between India through the Middle East, through Israel into uh, into Europe. Uh, Israel, if you remember, Benjamin Netanyahu in September at the General Assembly debate uh, stood up and he didn't have the drawing of the Iranian bomb that he normally had. He had a map that showed the role that Israel was playing in this connectivity. And that connectivity implied normalization of relations, uh, diplomatic and economic interaction. And Israel was going to serve as this economic hub, the thriving economy that would lead Israel to great things. That is never going to happen. It's finished. There will never be an India Middle East economic corridor that goes through Israel. That's over. And the Houthi have shown the Achilles heel of uh, Israel by shutting down the Bab el Mandeb. I keep saying that because I finally pronounce it right. Uh, and, and, uh, and, you know, uh, costing Israel billions of dollars in trade. Israel will never recover from this. Um, and the, the global isolation will, 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 will stay forever because Israel will continue to resist the creation of a Palestinian state. And so what's going to happen is it's going, life in Israel is going to become unlivable. And all these American Jews and all these European Jews that flew to Israel to live in their high rise, to live the nice life and sip their coffee and, you know, eat their kebab or whatever they do. Um, they're not going to, Israel's not going to be able to sustain that lifestyle anymore. So they're going to flee by the millions going back home. And what's going to be left is the pathetic few uh, who have nowhere to go. And therefore, the only route of survival is to be absorbed by a singular Palestinian national entity. Um, that's the future of Israel. They did it to themselves. They did it to themselves. Their arrogance, their murderous genocidal policies against the Palestinians has caught up with them. Um, and so what the rest of the world does isn't going to change that outcome. It could accelerate that outcome. And there may come a point in time where Saudi Arabia decides that it will, you know, open its skies to Houthi missiles. <laughs> you know, um, already the Iranians are starting to fire weapons. They blew up a, a, a oil refinery in Haifa the other day. Um, uh, Israel's finished. It's over for Israel. I mean, they haven't they haven't been counted out yet. But there's no way Israel is going to survive this this struggle. And that's the genius of what Hamas did on October seventh. Nobody wants to talk about that genius. But everybody knows that there's a October 6th reality and there's a post-October 7th reality. The post-October 7th reality is Israel's finished. How do you see the role of Netanyahu and his administration that were in power for so long in Israel? And this perception on the part of Israelis, because at the end of the day, they have to understand, they have to get along with Turkey, with these Arab states. No, they don't. They don't believe they have to get along. They're mad, at, they're mad at Netanyahu for being weak on October 7th. They're mad at Netanyahu for being weak in terms of getting the hostages back. But they support the genocidal policy in, uh, in Gaza. Why? Because political Zionism is about the supremacy of Jews. And the supremacy of Jews is linked to biblical references. Uh, for instance, why is, why is Netanyahu talking about Amalek? In the Almakites, because the Jewish people committed genocide against the seed of Amalek. It started with Samuel ordering Saul to kill King Agog and all of the Amalekites. Biblical reference. And he didn't. And God punished them for this. But the seed of Amalek left and went on and became the advisor to the king of Babylon, who married a Jewish girl named Esther. Haman, his name was. And he was conspiring to kill all the Jews in Babylon. But Esther got the king to flip the script. And instead of the Jews being slaughtered, they finished the job. They annihilated the seed of Amalek. Haman and 75,000 of his followers were slaughtered by the Jews in a genocidal frenzy that is celebrated every year in the holiday of him. The Jews celebrate genocide every year. Now, more rational Jews say, uh, it's, it's, we're not celebrating genocide, we're celebrating the survival of the Jewish race, the perseverance, the resilience. We're proud of the fact that we could survive under these things. 
okay, that's cool. But it's still genocide. They get uncomfortable when you push them on that. And they're like, yeah, it's sort of biblical thing, though. We don't really apply it today, except if you live in Israel. The Israelis today, the political Zionists today who reside in Israel, believe in Amalek. That's why the prime minister can say it and stay in power. That's why Israeli soldiers sit there and sing about annihilating the Sea of Amalek is their biggest mitzvah. That's their path to glory. That's their directive from God to kill the Palestinian people. That's why over 60% of them support what's going on in Gaza, because they're all genocidal, sick maniacs. And they will continue to be genocidal, sick maniacs as long as they have a nation state that sustains that mentality. A nation state grounded in the artificial construct of Jewish supremacy. Hamas has shown that a Jew dies just like everybody else. You pump enough bullets into a Jewish body, it dies just like a Christian body, just like a Buddhist body, just like anybody. There's no such thing as Jewish supremacy. They are not the chosen people of God. They're humans, just like everybody else. And until the Jews realize that in order to survive, they have to be part of the human race. They have to learn to get along with everybody as equals, not as superiors. There is no supreme law for the Jews. There is no exception for the Jews. Yes, your history sucks. Yes, I'm sorry for what happened to you in history, but that doesn't justify what you're doing today against the people of Gaza. What it does is condemn you in the eyes of the world and guarantee the eradication of this nation state that you're all hoping for, this land of the Jews will be gone. And if you continue it, and you continue to think that you're separate from humanity, then maybe humanity will treat you as something separate from them. And then we get back to square one where we started, which nobody wants to go to. The Jewish people are their own worst enemies. Both those who articulate in favor of Amalek in Palestine and those who are silent as this genocide takes place. If you're a Jew out there, the best thing you could do right now is stand up against Israel and stop this nonsense. Because otherwise, Israel is going to be the seat of your destruction. I, I, I would be surprised if Israel attacked Rafa. The U.S. isn't going to give him a green light. Moreover, I don't think the U.S. is going to come riding to the rescue of Israel if the consequences that are accrued by attacking Rafa manifest themselves. Now, this could be the end of Israel. Israel cannot defeat Hezbollah. Israel cannot defeat Syria. Israel cannot defeat Iran. If Jordan wants to take over the West Bank, once Israel's uh, up there fighting around in there, Jordan will take over the West Bank. If Egypt wants to move in on the Sinai again, Egypt will move in on the Sinai. This could be the physical destruction of Israel. But here it becomes dangerous. Seymour Hirsch wrote a book a while ago called The Samson Option. It's about the nuclear program of Israel. And the Samson Option is in biblical reference. Why do I keep bringing up the Bible? Because the damn Jewish state of Israel keeps making their entire existence predicated upon genocidal actions in the Bible. The Samson Option, of course, is Samson who was in the temple, and he brought the temple down because if he's going to die, everybody's going to die. And so under the Samson Option, if Israel is in the process of being physically eradicated, they will fire nuclear weapons off and destroy everybody they can with them. They will bring the house down under the notion that the world isn't going to then therefore allow the destruction of Israel. But we're facing a situation right now because of Israel's genocidal policy that the world will allow the destruction of Israel. Therefore, we could have a scenario where Israeli nuclear weapons are flying. It's a very scary proposition. Um, what are we going to do about it? I mean, this is at this point in time, I mean, you know, the best thing the United States could do is put a cruise missile into Benjamin Netanyahu's residence and kill the guy because he's the greatest threat to world security, international peace and security. Um, we'll see what happens. Uh, the, again, this is a this is a sick man, but this is a man who has um, allowed himself to be hypnotized by right wing fanatic rabbis into Talmudic nonsense about, you know, death of the pursuer this all this notion of you know again jewish supremacy where palestinians can be called human animals by israeli officials and not be condemned for it could you imagine if an american official came out and made a reference to people as human animals we wouldn't tolerate it we can't tolerate it. it's so far against what we stand for collectively as a nation even in our weakened morally weakened state we still wouldn't tolerate that in israel they applaud it they applaud it. This is the sickness of Israeli society that's becoming manifest for the world. 
the world is recognizing how sick Israel is. But the problem with the sickness is you can't just excise the cancer. This is a cancer that the moment the knife hits it, sends its cancerous cells in the form of nuclear weapons around the region to, to kill everybody. Israel is the greatest threat to international peace and security that has existed in modern times. It's high time for the world to realize that Israel has lost the right to exist as a modern nation state. You can't allow this cancerous entity to continue to exist. And if it does is allowed to exist, you have to get rid of its nuclear weapons. Well, the fact is Lloyd Austin is functioning as a um, secretary of defense. And so he can't make policy, especially in policy has been directed down by the White House. So he has to repeat the policy line. But I, I just I say this to everybody. Um, we know, thanks to the International Court of Justice, that, and, and I've talked about it, I've alluded to it, this whole Amalek reference is a genocidal reference to of biblical proportions. And Netanyahu has not only stated Amalek, meaning this, but he has empowered the military to carry out the eradication of the seed of Amalek. And we have this in forms of video and the entire approach, human animals, the whole thing. So we see the genocidal direction, intent, and activity on the part of the Israelis. Now, it's manifested in 33,000 civilian deaths so far, maybe more. They keep killing them every day. Um, and I've had people say that um, the 33,000, that's not genocide. We're talking about, you know, 2 million Palestinians, uh, 33,000. How could that be genocide? But my response is, let's go to the Wan Sea um, meeting <laughs> that the uh, Nazis had uh, to, to come up with the final solution in, back in World War II. Um, prior to that, there was no final solution. You couldn't talk about the genocide of the Jews because it hadn't been acted on. But at the Wan C, the Wan C protocol said, we're going to kill all the Jews. So that's a statement of intent. Then they sent instructions out to the SS and uh, German entities to implement this. And they began implementing it. At what point in time do we call what happened to the Jews genocide? I'd like to put this out to an Israeli a population right now. When do you want to call it genocide? When the first Jew is killed? When the first thousand Jews are killed? First 33,000 Jews are killed? No, that's not enough, is it? Simply saying you want to eradicate the Jewish race and wipe them off the face of the earth, but you've only killed 33,000, that's not enough. A million? That's only one-sixth of the total that were dead. Is it really genocide if you've only killed one-sixth of it? When does it become genocide? And the answer is the moment they say they want to commit genocide. The Israelis have committed to a genocidal policy. Lloyd Austin is an idiot, is a morally inept, fundamentally decrepit human being for saying that because the Israelis have stated a genocidal policy. They've acted on it with intent to kill everybody, everybody. So Lloyd Austin, I have no use for the man. He's not a man. He's something different. Because his answer reflected a total lack of humanity, human compassion. The former weapons inspector delves into the strike on Israel's Nevatim Air Base, offering a nuanced analysis that unveils the strategic underpinnings behind Iran's actions. Ritter's assessment, grounded in his deep understanding of weapons proliferation and Middle Eastern geopolitics, sheds light on the broader implications of the attack and the message it conveys to regional and global actors. Ritter highlights Iran's deliberate choice to refrain from inflicting maximum lethality on Israeli targets, opting instead to target specific buildings within the airbase. This calculated approach, as Ritter suggests, serves as a means for Iran to assert its capacity to project force while avoiding outright escalation. By targeting infrastructure rather than personnel or aircraft, Iran aims to send a clear signal of its military capabilities without provoking a disproportionate response. Central to Ritter's analysis is the notion of strategic messaging. He argues that Iran's strike on Nevatim is not merely an isolated incident, but part of a broader campaign aimed at signaling its deterrent capabilities to both Israel and the United States. By demonstrating its ability to strike with precision and evade interception, Iran seeks to challenge the perceived dominance of its adversaries and assert itself as a regional power player. Ritter's assessment also underscores the strategic significance of the strike in reshaping the security calculus in the Middle East.
Israeli military officials, as Ritter suggests, are left grappling with the realization that Iran possesses the means to replicate such attacks across the region. This, in turn, raises questions about the efficacy of traditional defense mechanisms and the need for a recalibration of strategic priorities in light of evolving threats. Moreover, Ritter warns of the broader implications of Iran's actions for regional stability and international security. As Iran flexes its military muscle and signals its readiness to confront its adversaries, Ritter urges policymakers to heed the underlying message conveyed by the strike and adapt their strategies accordingly. Diplomatic engagement and strategic recalibration, he contends, are imperative to mitigate the risk of further escalation and foster a more stable and secure Middle East. Thank you for joining us today. To expand our reach and amplify our message, we encourage you to like, share and subscribe to our channel. Together, let's raise awareness and strive for peace. Until next time, stay informed and engaged. Peace.